My wife and I were on tour with our band a few years back, and we did a show at this really cool little church in Kristiansand, Norway. And afterwards, as we were meeting and greeting everyone, this older gentleman, maybe in his late 50s, came up and started talking to Deb. Now, my wife is a beautiful redhead with a big personality, and she loves people. And I wasn't close enough to hear what they were talking about, but when I looked over, I could tell by the body language that they had an exciting conversation going. They were both smiling, and, and they seemed to have some connection in common. And they were quite excited to have met one another. And as this Norwegian man began to politely end the conversation so, so that Deb could talk to the next person in line, she reached out and gave him a big hug. I mean, that's just her personality. And, and I'll never forget this visual. As Deb embraced him, this older Norwegian man leaned away, stiffened up with his arms pinned at his side as Deb was hugging him, right? And he had this surprised look on his face. It was this hilarious clash of cultures as this gregarious American woman unknowingly invaded the personal space of this kind but reserved Norwegian man. And it was interesting because they had both very much enjoyed the conversation. They just had different cultural ideas about how one ends an enjoyable conversation with a friend. That story came to mind as I was putting together this teaching because Anyone who's traveled outside the borders of their own country knows that even in this highly globalized age, there are still a whole lot of cultural differences out there. So it's not uncommon to accidentally offend somebody or completely miss the context of a social situation. Even when properly translating the language, there are still things we miss. <laughs> At one show in Budapest, they put out this amazing spread of food for us. And I ask, well, what, what, what is that dish? And well, they said, well, that's Hungarian goulash. And I said, wow, that looks really good. And then the guy next to me waves his hand and mutters something in Hungarian and just walks off. And I looked at our translator and I said, what did he just say? And she kind of laughed and she said, well, if you want to know what he literally said, it was, the fence is not made from sausage. <laughs> what? I was totally confused. But she explained, that's a Hungarian expression that just means... It's not as good as you think. And in the same way that we need to have this sort of cultural awareness when traveling outside the borders of our own country, we also need to have a certain cultural awareness when we approach the text of the Bible. And this isn't about whose culture is better. It's simply about recognizing the differences between the cultures. Because this amazing book that we hold to be our ultimate source of authority was written in a culture completely foreign to the one we live in today. The Bible was written in different languages than most of us speak, in a different part of the world than most of us live, and in a, and, and in a time and era that, that's 2,000 plus years removed from the world we know. I mean, as an American, I can tell you that the Bible was written more than 700 years before my native language of English came into use and more than 1,700 years before my country even existed. And the biblical authors not only ate different foods and greeted one another differently and, and used different expressions than we do today, they also communicated in a different mode of thinking and approached literature with a different style and a different set of expectations. And yes, God's truth can and does span the millennia of time and language barriers and cultural barriers. But as students of the Bible, taking the time to understand these cultural differences can bring us so much more richness and insight. So we're going to cover two things today. We'll first look at some specific differences between our modern Western culture and the culture in which the Bible is written. In fact, we're going to look at six cultural differences that every student of the Bible should be aware of. And we're not going to dive into in any sort of exhaustive way. Consider this more of a primer to help us recognize that cultural gap. Because the proper context for understanding the Bible is the context in which the Bible was produced. Now, our, our modern Western understanding of culture and communication isn't wrong or bad, of course but it's alien to the biblical writers, and it's alien to the way that God dealt with his people in antiquity. In scripture, he always graciously works within the cultural context of his people. 
because it's the only context they knew. So when God was communicating and, and setting expectations and guiding them, he did so within the culture in which they lived. And that's what we want to tap, in, tap into. And secondly, we're going to apply this cultural awareness to a major biblical theme, the kingdom of God. And I think you'll find it helpful and maybe even enlightening. The idea of studying the Bible in its original context is growing in popularity, which I find exciting. So there are a lot of resources out there. There are books like Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes by Kenneth Bailey, which is a fascinating read. This is a man who, who lived 60 years of his life in the Middle East. And for 40 of those years, he taught in seminaries and institutes. So his cultural insight is amazing. He wrote this. The Bible is an Eastern book. We see it through the colored glasses of Western culture. Much is lost. We miss the subtleties of humor and many of the underlying assumptions. We do not understand the ingrained attitudes that illuminate a story or illustration. What lies between the lines, what is felt and not spoken, is of deepest significance. And, and, and here are a few other books I grabbed from my library. Uh, Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes by Richards and O'Brien. And on page 11, they write, in whatever place and whatever age people read the Bible, we instinctively draw from our own cultural context to make sense of what we're reading. We can easily forget that Scripture is a foreign land and that reading the Bible is a cross-cultural experience. That's good. Uh, there's also Reading Romans with Eastern Eyes by Jackson W. And uh, Sitting at the Feet of Rabbi Jesus by Spangler and Tverberg. And there are, there's, there's lots more out there. There's also a great free online Bible resource called Walking the Text that I would highly recommend. They do a great job of giving a lot of Middle Eastern cultural and even geographical context to the Bible. And my fellow professor, Christy McClelland, also does amazing work in this area. Her website is newlensbiblicalstudies.com. So she's been leading teaching tours in Israel for I think like 15 years. And she's got online courses and, and a couple new books coming out that look amazing. And, and I'll put links to all these resources in the description below. By the way, I'm not getting paid for any of this. I'm just trying to be helpful. So let's get a little more specific and let me walk you through six cultural differences that every student of the Bible should be aware of. Let's start our survey of differences at the highest level of worldview. So today in the Western world, we live very much under what is called linear logical thinking, which goes back to the Greeks. Jeff Brenner, the director of the Ancient Hebrew Research Center, puts it this way. The Greek thinker uses a linear logic that flows in steps from a beginning to an end. Each step is linked closely to the next in a coherent and rational fashion. In contrast to this, the Hebrew thinker uses block logic, which groups things together according to their similarities. Okay, so let's go to the chalkboard and put our first cultural difference here. Linear versus block. So a common way you might hear this difference described is that modern Western logic is sort of an either or approach, whereas ancient Eastern thinking is more about both and. And just know that we're painting with pretty broad brushstrokes here, but the differences are real. In fact, let's look at a quick example of this difference in logical frameworks using the creation account in Genesis 1. So we, we Western readers naturally approach Genesis using linear logic. So we'll draw an arrow here and we'll put the seven days up here. One, two, three, four, five. And we tend to read the creation account in chronological order, right? First God did this, then he did that, and next he did this, and so on, right? And because of this, we can sometimes find ourselves wondering things like, if the sun wasn't created until day four, how can the text say, and there was evening and morning the first day, and the second day, and the third day, right? How can there be an evening and a morning with no sun? But this isn't the logical framework in which the narrative was written. It was written within the worldview and the context of an ancient culture that used block logic rather than linear logic. So the author 
is recording the different events of the creation account as sort of blocks or chunks of related events, rather than a, a purely chronological sequence. If you notice, the first three days of creation are related to separation. So on day one, God separated light from darkness, right? In day two, he separated the water from the sky. And on day three, he separated land from the water, right? And, and then in the next three days, God filled these elements of creation, right? So on day four, God filled the light with the sun, right? And the dark with the moon, right? And on day five, he filled the water with fish and the sky with birds. And on day six, he filled the land with animals and ultimately mankind, right? And, and even deeper than that, there's some parallelism going on here. For example, days one and four parallel one another, right? They could actually be seen as recording the same event in which God created the light and separated it from the darkness and placed it in the heavens to mark the seasons and days and years. So when it comes to reading the Bible in its original context, we need to keep this idea of linear versus block logic in mind. It's gonna mess with our chronology sometimes. It's kind of like the way movie directors will sometimes jump back and forth across the, the chronological timeline of their story. You know, you'll see a scene in which a character's killed and then a few scenes later, he's alive again. And it takes you a minute to realize that you're being shown the scenes out of order. It's kind of what's going on here in the creation account, and we see similar things in Exodus when Israel's at Mount Horeb and several other places. So the next difference we should be aware of is concrete versus abstract. Western thinking typically wants to categorize things in concrete structured terms, right? Like laws and rules and principles. The ancient thinking of the, of the biblical authors, on the other hand, is more abstract. It's more focused on story and theme and narrative. So when Westerners read a, read a passage, we're often looking for the, for the law or the rule or the principle that we can extract and apply to our lives. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the ancient Eastern authors of the Bible tend to approach the text in a broader, more abstract sense. They're communicating through themes and, and patterns and symbolism as much as through details and information. And I'm not just talking about the poetic or prophetic material. This is even true in the historical narratives of the Bible. And not only did they include these sorts of abstract themes and patterns in their writing style, their readers would have expected as much and, and would be alert to those thematic and symbolic elements when they read the text. And this leads us to the next difference of analysis versus synthesis. Now, our Western focus is on digging deep into the text and, and studying and analyzing passages and verses and even single words. The Eastern focus, on the other hand, is more about synthesizing the narrative and identifying themes and, as Professor Christie likes to say, stringing the pearls together. This is the realm of the discipline called biblical theology, which deals with overarching themes and typology and patterns, what we would call meta-narrative. And it's very much the mode in which the biblical authors communicated with their readers. And I think this is why we modern readers often find explanations involving typology or themes or symbolism kind of unsatisfying, right? They're, they're too abstract. We want more, you know? We want concrete proof texts and clear, unambiguous statements. For example, when I was a guest on a YouTube channel called Tanakh Talk, which is run by a couple of Jewish friends who don't believe in Jesus and are constantly trying to disprove Christianity, well, they asked me on to, to address the question, where does the Tanakh, the Old Testament, say that the Messiah will be killed and raised again on the third day? Show me that prophecy, they said. And I responded by saying, look, if you're looking for a, a, an explicit prediction, as far as I know, there are none. And notice that the demand for an explicit prediction is kind of Western. 
And I explain that the Tanakh communicates truth in many more ways than simply explicit predictions. It also speaks and teaches through symbolism and typology, poetry, narrative patterns, um, thematic development and metaphors and, and personification and so on, right? These are ancient Eastern modes of communicating truth that were used by the ancient Eastern authors of scripture. And guess what? In the Tanakh, there is a very clear pattern of God doing redemptive and even resurrection things on the third day. And I walk them through three or four of those passages. And by the way, I'll, I'll link to that video below if you want to see it. But they were completely unsatisfied with that abstract answer. They wanted to see concrete statements, which I found kind of ironic since the hosts I was speaking with are two Western Gentiles who left Christianity and converted to Judaism and are apparently unfamiliar with the ancient Eastern context of the Tanakh. And full transparency here, as a modern man raised in a Western culture with a Western mindset, I feel that same desire for concrete answers, right? And I feel that same twinge of dissatisfaction when the Bible doesn't come out and explicitly say what I wish it said especially in my apologetic work, when I'm having so many discussions with so many people, I often find myself wishing I could just find a nice, clean answer. And when I feel that pang of dissatisfaction, I have to let it remind me that it's not the Bible that needs to change. It's me. The Bible doesn't need to become more Western and logical and concrete. No, I need to learn to read the living Word of God on its own terms. I need to, to, to open myself up to learning about the ancient Eastern ways of communicating truth that were used by the men that God chose to write the Bible in, in the time and culture in which he gave them his word. And the reason I'm pointing out these differences is so that we can try to do just that. We can at least make an effort to understand the text from its own perspective. Okay, so the next difference is how versus why and as an example, in Exodus 3, when Moses encounters the angel of the Lord in the burning bush, Westerners typically think, well, how did that happen? Was the angel of God literally in the bush? What did his voice sound like, right? Middle, Easterner, Middle Easterners, on the other hand, will start with a different question. Why did that happen? Why did God choose to reveal himself to Moses in that way? And that's related to the next difference, which is partly due to the, to the difference between individualistic and communal cultures in general. I mean, here in America, we are rugged individualists who love our personal freedom, right? Don't tread on me, an army of one, right? But Eastern culture is much different. They're communal and far more focused on how their actions and decisions will affect their family or their tribe. So let's call this fourth difference internal versus external. And we Westerners tend to read the Bible with an inward personal focus, asking, what does this passage teach about me, right? How can I apply this to my life? And the ancient Eastern mindset of the Bible was focused outward and upward. And they ask, what does this text teach about God? And understanding that this was the worldview of the writers of the Bible tells us that almost everything they wrote was ultimately theological in nature. They were ultimately writing to teach their readers about God. Okay, so the last difference is knowledge, running out of space here, versus revelation. <laughs> so this is about the Western focus on learning versus the Eastern focus on experiencing. We Westerners, and I, and I say this as a professor of theology and a student myself, we tend to approach study as a means of acquiring knowledge and learning things. And there's nothing wrong with that. By contrast, the Eastern approach is more about reading the text in order to receive revelation and experience God. And there's obviously nothing wrong with that approach either. In fact, I could use a little more of that in my life. So while God's word can certainly speak to us, regardless of our, of our cultural background, I do think it's helpful for students of the Bible to approach the text in order, first trying to see it through an Eastern lens and then through our modern Western lens. Well, why do I say that? 
Because again, the, the Bible is a product of an ancient Eastern culture. And trying to read it first through an Eastern lens gets us closer to the world and the context of the biblical authors. And then we can analyze and study and learn how that can be applied in our modern context. And that's exactly what we're going to do next. So we're going to apply this cultural framework to the kingdom of God as found in Scripture. Okay, so what does the Bible teach about the kingdom of God or, or the kingdom of heaven? And interestingly, this is a phrase that only appears in the New Testament. And by the way, just to get it out of the way up front, the phrases kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven both refer to the same thing. This is obvious from, from many passages in the Bible. For example, in Matthew 19, Jesus uses these two phrases interchangeably. Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So it's the same thing. Now, for our purposes, I want us to focus on the nature of the kingdom of God. Our Western minds are going to want to enforce concrete categories on it. But when we look at the kingdom of God holistically across the New Testament, we find that it's much more abstract, much more Eastern. And so we're left with a sort of uncomfortable paradox. So let's do a survey of the biblical text and see what we can learn about the kingdom of God. Now, the first mention of the kingdom is found in Matthew 3, which says, verse 1, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This was the opening proclamation of the gospel of Jesus, first uttered by John the Baptist. And the same proclamation is made by Jesus himself at the beginning of his ministry in Matthew 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the first thing we learn about the kingdom of heaven is that it's at hand. So what does that mean? Well, the Greek word there is engizo, which means to come near or to draw near. In fact, many English translations say the kingdom has come near instead of at hand. So this is what Jesus commands his disciples to teach. For example, when he sends out the, the 12 apostles in Matthew 10, he says, verse 7, And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is in Jesus, is at hand. And in Luke 10, when Jesus sends out the 72, he says, verse 8, Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has in Jesus has come near to you. But when you, whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has in Jesus, has come near. And Jesus teaches the, the nearness of the kingdom even more directly in his confrontation with the Pharisees in Matthew 12. This is when Jesus cast the demons out of the possessed man, and the Pharisees said in verse 24, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. And in his response, in verse 28, Jesus declares, If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And this is a more emphatic Greek word. He says the kingdom of God has phthano, it has overtaken you, it has come upon you, it's in your face. So the kingdom of God is at hand. But what is the kingdom exactly? Well, we learn a little bit more about the kingdom in Luke 16. Here Jesus says, oops, verse 16, The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. So this explains why we don't hear the phrase kingdom of God until the New Testament. The kingdom is, in some sense, a new era that began with Jesus, and it's distinct from the era of the law and the prophets. I like how Trent Butler describes it. He writes, The law and the prophets ruled until John the Baptist came. They were God's method of revelation for people up until John. 
John introduced something or someone better than the law and the prophets. John introduced Jesus. Jesus introduced the presence of the kingdom of God. So this is exciting news. The kingdom of God arrived with Jesus. It's at hand and available to us today. And that's exactly what Paul was proclaiming in the very last verse of the book of Acts. Acts 28.31 says he was, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And yet, there are many other passages in Scripture that say that the kingdom of God is a future reality. Despite the immediacy and presence of the kingdom in the passages we just looked at, Jesus also taught the kingdom of God as a future reality. For example, what did he teach us to pray? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, isn't it already here? And in Matthew 8, when he was marveling at the faith of the centurion, Jesus said this, uh, verse 10, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. This is end times language. And in Matthew 13, in his parable of the weeds, where, where Jesus likens the end of the age to a harvest, he says this, verse 40, Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will ascend his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and, law, and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. And in Matthew 25, when Jesus is teaching about the final judgment at his second coming, where he'll separate the sheep from the goats, listen to what he says. Verse 33, And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And, and, and in Luke's record of the Last Supper, Jesus says, so we're in Luke 22, verse 18, For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So there's a clear future sense of the kingdom as well. And this ambiguity, so to speak, was even sensed by the apostles. Right? Luke 19 tells us this. Uh, verse 11, as they heard these things, Jesus proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, and then Jesus goes on to tell the parable of the ten minas. So his disciples were expecting the kingdom to appear immediately. And Jesus addressed their expectations by talking about a king who had to leave before he could return to his kingdom. And Paul would later speak of the kingdom of God as a future reality as well, as something that will be inherited. And to add to the mystery, there are even some passages that seem to teach that the kingdom of God is both future and now. Check out Luke 17, verse 20. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. <laughs> and notice the abstract, ancient Eastern mode of logic communicated in this passage. The kingdom is not coming in ways that can be observed, right? Future tense. And it is in the midst of you. Present tense. Or in Luke 23, 42, when Jesus is hanging on the cross and the thief on the cross next to him cries out, notice what they say about the kingdom. Verse 42, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, future tense. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today, present tense, you will be with me in paradise. So you can see how our Western minds are kind of looking for a concrete, logical definition of the kingdom of God. Is it now or is it in the future? And the biblical answer is yes. When we look at the New Testament as a whole, 
we're presented with a more abstract concept of the kingdom that falls into the ancient Eastern both and type of logic. And that's actually where even modern Western biblical scholars have been forced to land on their understanding of the kingdom of God. I like how the Faith Life Study Bible describes it. They write, To borrow the phrase made popular by George Eldon Ladd, the kingdom of God is already, not yet. God's kingdom has a dual dimension. Jesus initiated the kingdom on earth, and wherever God's will is carried out, the kingdom is a reality. The kingdom, however, had not been fully manifested in Jesus' day, nor has it in ours. We do not yet live in a world where God's will is a complete reality. The kingdom of God is already but not yet. Scholars refer refer to this as uh, inaugurated eschatology. And a common analogy you'll hear is World War II. So on May 8th, 1945, which is known as VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, celebrations erupted around the world to mark the end of World War II. It, It meant an end to nearly six years of brutal fighting. And yet, World War II wasn't over yet. The fighting would continue, thousands more people would die, and two atomic bombs would be dropped before the the war finally ended for good on September 2nd, 1945, which is known as Victory in in Japan Day. So we might call this an inaugurated victory, right? On VE Day, the outcome of the war was all but determined. The the Allies were going to win, but there was still work to do before that victory would ultimately be consummated. Now, it's not a perfect analogy for the kingdom of God, but it's pretty helpful. With the kingdom, there was a period of inauguration that was first proclaimed by John the Baptist. And that was followed by a period of progressive or gradual fulfillment, which is still playing out to this day. And what we're living in today is known as a liminal state or liminal period. It's a time of transition. So... A liminal state is an in-between state where you've left your old status, but you haven't fully reached your new position yet. So if you're in a liminal state, you're straddling what you are now and what you're about to be. And these liminal states or spaces are commonly found in scripture. For example, God placed the entire world in a liminal state during the great flood. As the status of the world evolved over a matter of weeks from being destroyed to becoming renewed to renewed. And Moses entered liminal space on the top of Mount Sinai when he spent 40 days and nights receiving the law from God. And later, because of their unbelief, Yahweh sentenced Israel to the liminal space of the wilderness where where the Israelites wandered for 40 years. They had been rescued out of Egypt and promised their own land, but they hadn't received it yet. They were in that in-between state. And Jonah, he spent three days and three nights in the liminal space of of the belly of a great fish, where his status changed from disobedient to obedient, right? And then he warned Nineveh, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And in that liminal state of impending destruction, the city of Nineveh repented and their status changed from doomed to saved. And remember, Yeshua spent 40 liminal days in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. He'd been baptized and recognized by his father, but his ministry had not yet begun. And after his resurrection, Jesus appeared among his disciples and and was seen by hundreds of people. He had been resurrected, but he had not yet ascended to the right hand of the father. So these are all divine periods of transition, right? It's the way our merciful heavenly father works. And I believe it's, at least in part, because he's condescending to the frailty and the limitations of humanity. God knew from the beginning everything that would happen because he ordained it all. But his ways are far higher than our ways. And he knows that we human beings need some time to process big changes. So today we live in a liminal period in which the kingdom of God has been inaugurated, but not yet fully consummated. And and we get to participate in the fulfillment of the kingdom of God as we share the gospel and as we act as the hands and feet of Jesus by loving and serving our neighbors. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, 
We're praying for the kingdom of God to continue to break through into this world until it comes to its full consummation at the second coming of Christ. In fact, at my church, we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in Nashville, Tennessee, as it is in heaven. And you can pray the same thing about where you live because we all have a part to play in the already but not yet kingdom of God. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this teaching helpful. Shalom.